Uh, so before I have Cheryl come up, I just I want to just tell you something that's kind of interesting. How many people have heard our commercials on the Christian radio station? So about a year and a half ago, is that right? A year and a half ago, Cheryl was driving around on a Monday, right? On a Monday, crying out to God, asking for direction of where to go, and she heard one of our commercials on the radio, and she steered her car right here to the church. Right? And she's been here ever since. She just graduated from the step study. Right? So that's amazing. So I'm going to go ahead and invite her up. Do you come on up, Cheryl? Let's give her a hand. Yeah. You the stool? Sure. Okay. I'll give her a try. We'll do you see. Want me to pray for you or yes. are you going to be okay? I think I'll be okay. You'll be okay. Okay, so when you're done, though, stay here and Candace will come up and pray for you. Okay. okay let's I give her another hand. Woo! <laughs> All right, I'd like to begin with Psalm 1914 and turn it into a prayer. Lord, let these words in my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer, amen. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus who is celebrating recovery from alcohol and I currently struggle with codependency and mental health. My name is Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. I have a sister who's a year and three months younger than I am. My sister and I were the best of friends and mortal enemies. When we got into fights, we would take turns pulling each other's hair quietly, not to draw my mother's attention. <laughs> when my sister and I would argue, my dad would say to my mom, make them behave. My brother is nine years younger. I tried so hard to be perfect and keep the peace in our family. I did the cooking, the cleaning, childcare for my brother, referee for my siblings, and counselor for my parents. It was my job to anticipate everyone's needs and meet those needs before even being asked. If I had to be asked, it was too late. I was hypervigilant and always trying to prevent an argument or a meltdown. In our house, whoever yelled the loudest could be heard. The loudest person had the biggest feelings and the most important needs. I wasn't allowed to have feelings and needs. I felt like Cinderella and would daydream that maybe one day my prince would come to rescue me. My parents were very anxious people. When my dad was overwhelmed, he would throw up. My mom had horrible migraine headaches and would have to lie down in a quiet, dark room, and I would take care of her. Sometimes she would refuse to eat, and other times she would make herself throw up. Her mood would quickly change, and she would have meltdowns where she would yell and throw things. It was best to give my mom lots of space when she was mad. I tried to protect my sister and tell her to leave my mom alone. It usually ended with my mom accidentally hurting herself and crying. My sister would go to comfort my mom, and then my sister would get hit because my mom did not want to be touched. After hurting us, she would buy us things. I came home from school one day after a school counselor had visited our elementary school. I was so excited because I knew what was wrong with us. We were a dysfunctional family. I told this to my mom, and she slapped me. I grew up going to church, and I loved it. We were all on our very best behavior. I liked to sing in church, and I, sing, I was singing very loudly. And we learned Jesus loves me, and this little light of mine. And when I was anxious, I would sing these songs, and they brought me comfort. And then I remember singing in church one day, and my dad leaned down and whispered in my ear, you're singing too loud. You and I can't sing like your mom and your sister can. Mouth the word so no one can hear you. Psalm 101 through 2 says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Yeah. School was challenging. As a first grader, I was with my mom in a parent-teacher conference. And Mrs. Dietrich said, Don't expect too much for her, and you won't be disappointed. I struggled to make friends and was teased and bullied throughout my elementary school days, and this continued into middle and high school. I've never really fit in and always felt different and excluded. I had an unmet need for connection, acceptance, and belonging. In high school, I ate my lunch in the library and threw up every morning before school. Our family doctor, Dr. Sullivan's advice, was to dress and try to act like all the other girls my age. So I met my husband in our homeroom class in high school, and we became friends. He had a lot of friends. 
He was in a surf band, and he gave the best hugs. So we started dating after graduation. He challenged my thinking and the way I grew up. Once we were having a discussion about someone stealing from you, and I was raised with the value that you protect what is yours, he said, what if that person needs it more than you do? What he said inspired me to be more compassionate to others. Our first date was to a thrift store, and my parents made me take my sister with me. <laughs> she did everything she could to embarrass me by picking out the ugliest oversized dresses and sitting between us in his Toyota truck. We continued to date without our chaperone, and I had a very early curfew. As my night was ending, his night was just beginning. He would drop me off and then go drink with his friends. I was shocked when I discovered he drank. Before long, I was drinking too. I had a very low self-esteem and needed to feel accepted and be included. He was living with his parents and would hide the empty alcohol bottles under his bed. I'd help him load them up in a garbage bag, and late at night, we'd find an empty dumpster to throw them away in. On his 21st birthday, he was driving cross-country from California to New York to start a new job. Before he left, he proposed, and I accepted. I stayed behind and was working part-time, going to school full-time and living with my parents. I usually took the bus, and one day, my mom decided to take me to work. So before dropping me off, she said he would never marry because... Why buy the cow when you can get the milk for free? Two weeks later, on Valentine's Day, I flew to New York. I chose to leave, and I couldn't take my siblings with me. They felt like I had abandoned them, and our relationships would never be the same. We got married on May 22, 1999, in Staten Island, New York, and we honeymooned in Niagara Falls. I was 20 years old, and my husband was 21. New York didn't work out, and we both lost our jobs. So five months later, we moved back to California and in with his parents. While going to culinary school, my husband got his DUI. And his family, that wasn't a big deal. So the drinking continued. In 2001, I was one term away from graduating and getting my bachelor's degree to be an elementary school teacher. I chose to put his career first, and we moved to Oregon without earning my degree. My mother-in-law and father-in-law divorced, and my mother-in-law also moved to Oregon. The drinking increased, and he started making his own beer. So on St. Patrick's Day, 2005, he got so drunk that he blacked out and fell out of a chair and had a bloody nose. I did not know what to do, so I went and I got my mother-in-law to help me. She had never seen him like that. And I will never forget the look that he gave me when I betrayed our secret. Luke 8, 17 says, for there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed and nothing concealed that will not be brought, known or brought out into the open. The next day he could quit drinking and so did I. My greatest fear was that he would start drinking again one day. After getting sober, we bought our first house and then I hurt my back at work and I was taking pain medication, muscle relaxers and migraine medicine. I suffered from chronic pain for a year. Then, that Thanksgiving, my parents decided to come for a visit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's where you're like, dun, dun, dun. I fell back into my old habits of trying to be perfect. Memories from the past were too painful to process. Physical and emotional pain mixed with exhaustion caused a mental health crisis. I called my grandma, who said to praise God in the middle of the storm and when it was too much to look up. I knew something was very wrong with me. I called 911 and I said that I was having thoughts of killing my dog. I couldn't remember much. I know that there was a struggle with a knife with my husband, a phone was being ripped from the wall and running to my mother-in-law's house in the middle of the night screaming. A very kind police officer came, put me in some handcuffs in the back of his car and said, I'm gonna get you to the hospital. Then the hospital transferred me to a mental hospital in Corvallis. A very kind couple transported me to Corvallis, and on the way, we listened to worship music. I committed myself to Samaritan inpatient mental health. And the first day there, I remember my grandma's words, to praise God in the middle of the storm. I looked up, and there was a skylight. Psalm 46.10 says, be still and know that I am God. I got the medicine I needed, some rest, and routine. 
Once I was stable, I called my husband and asked him to bring me two things, my Bible and the quilt that my great-grandma had made me. I saw God working there. I shared Jesus boldly with others and prayed with them. I wasn't scared because we were all there because we were broken and needed healing. After being released, I went to a pain clinic for my chronic pain and spent two months in a hotel by myself, tapering off of methadone. I was prescribed for pain. I learned about self-care and the importance of my mental health and how it is linked to my physical health. While we were apart, my husband said that he couldn't make me happy. And at the time, it hurt to hear him say that, and then I realized that I had expected him to make me happy, and that was not. 2008, I was baptized. That day started out sunny, and when our pastor rose me out of the water, it started raining loudly. Acts 2.38 says, to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. My worst fear came true, and my husband started drinking again. Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. His drinking progressed gradually over time. It started with kombucha, then non-alcoholic beer, then light beer, then regular beer, then wine, and later hard alcohol. And then in 2018, I started drinking, and I knew the consequences and what would happen, and I did it anyway. And after 13 years of being sober, I drank with him because I was fun when I drank. We, my need for connection with my husband was so great, I ignored the consequences. And now alcohol be, had become my coping skill. Alcohol severely impacted our, both of our health, and we still didn't stop drinking. I chose to keep drinking, and we did everything in excess. Drinking, eating, spending money, and the thing is that it wasn't all bad. When we drank, we went to fancy wineries and cool bars and ate amazing food. We played board games and had great conversations. And guess what? I don't really remember all the really bad stuff. So if I thought that something was hard and pleasant, I would just tell myself not to remember, and I wouldn't. So things escalated when my husband's department closed down and he lost his job. There were times when I felt alone because he was binge drinking and he would black out. He would stop drinking and then he, that would maybe last a few months or weeks and then he would start drinking again. And then finally I had had enough. All I wanted to do was eat, sleep, and drink alcohol. No amount of food, sleep, or alcohol was big enough to fill the God-sized hole in my life. It got to the point that I wanted to go to sleep and never wake up. I'd pray that God would just let me die in my sleep and I would get angry when I woke up in the morning. During the three years I chose to drink, I was living a double life. I was hearing God's word and not living out his truth. November 2020, I stopped drinking, and I never started drinking alcohol again. <laughs> and I celebrated two years of sobriety in November. <laughs> So my husband had to go to Washington for a job interview, and he went alone. And at the time, he had stopped drinking, and he was nervous about the interview, and he drank, which turned, in, turned into binge drinking. And I was living my nightmare. He would call me and not know where he was, where his hotel room was, where his wallet or his suitcase were. He never made it to that interview, and God was in control. And I dropped to my knees, and I cried out to God in prayer, and I finally surrendered. Codependency can be defined as when you love someone so much you help them destroy you by trying to save them. And the first principle to the road to recovery is to realize that I am not God. The first of the 12 steps says that I admitted that I was powerless over my addictions and compulsive behaviors and that my life had become unmanageable. My life was out of control. I had to put all my trust in God and God got my husband home safely. That day, he stopped drinking, and in January, my husband celebrated two years sobriety. I originally looked up Celebrate Recovery for my husband. We moved, <laughs> insert laugh. We moved from Eugene to Springfield, and our house was a few blocks from this Springfield Celebrate Recovery, and I heard a commercial on Hope 107.9 for the CR that was just down the street, and I knew this was God showing me what I needed. I heard a testimony that night that no hurt is wasted. 
and I went to small groups and brought with me a journal my mother-in-law had given me, and the same scripture on my journal was on the wall. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. I feel that completing the step study was an act of obedience, and I'm now seeing prayers being answered and God working my life. Just because things are hard doesn't mean that they are bad. I've learned to fully surrender daily to God's will, and the step study has helped me realize that I had a very deep hurt within me from the past, and Jesus and I are on a journey together to heal that hurt, and I'm allowing Jesus to heal me and my marriage. So on May 22nd, my husband and I will have our 24th wedding anniversary. Making my amends and offering others forgiveness to myself and others has released me from the chains of the past and healing my hurt. After doing my inventory, I realized that I was angry and I struggle identifying my anger. I learned that keeping secrets in my childhood carried over to keeping drinking a secret. I learned that I felt betrayed by those I let close to me. I put the needs of others first and wasn't even aware that I even had needs or what they were. I had unmet needs for connection, acceptance, and belonging. I feel fellowship with my sisters in Christ and that they, are truly, that they truly care for me. I know now that my identity is in Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, and not in my mental health diagnosis. My doctor is also in recovery, and he said, if giving me a diagnosis gets me the help that I need, then what does it matter what that diagnosis is? He also said that when I was young, I had a very deep feelings, and instead of being taught how to deal with those emotions in healthy ways, I was taught to repress and ignore them. This resulted in my needs not getting met and developing unhealthy beliefs and unhealthy coping skills. This also resulted in my struggle with my mental health. To the newcomer, I'd ask you to consider surrendering your whole life to Jesus and then daily surrendering to his will for your life because you've tried everything else in your own strength and that's not working and why not try Jesus? Also, I recommend saying the serenity prayer out loud daily. Serenity means the absence of chaos, the ability to give and receive love in self-enhancing ways and a deliberate decision to practice a calm attitude despite my problems and emotions. So I'd like to end with a scripture and turn it into a prayer. Number 6, 24 through 26 says, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Thank you for letting me share my testimony.